When you think about the world in which humans have existed for most of our time on planet Earth, it has been a world of scarcity and ever-present danger. If you want to survive in a world of scarcity and ever-present danger, what better way to optimize survival than, than to make sure that every pleasurable experience is fleeting and is furthermore followed by pain such that we are eternal seekers, never satisfied with what we have, always wanting more. Okay. Hi, Anna. Thank you so much for giving me and my listeners your time. And we're here to talk about your book and your work uh, in particular. The book is called Dopamine Nation, Finding a Balance in the Age of Indulgence. I think that's right. Is that's that right? right. Yeah. All right. And as a, somebody in recovery myself, also as a therapist myself, and I work in various domains of the mental health field. So I work in private practice, but also in clinic. I have a brother who lives with schizophrenia. And so okay. I'm very familiar with the whole world of all of this. And yeah. I think in the book, you do such a lovely job at sort of mashing together so many different <laughs> perspectives, including your personal one, which I think I was often touched by throughout the book as you kind of referenced how some of these things relate to you. And it takes some skill and humility to do that. I think you did it so wonderfully well. Yeah. So I guess the first question is just to give us a little bit of insight into your journey and sort of what led you to write the book. The book was really the culmination of two plus decades of working in psychiatry, most of that working primarily with people with various forms of addiction. And having felt that I had learned a thing or two and that other people might benefit from learning what I had learned. So that was essentially the, the goal of the book. I wanted to write for a general lay audience. Um, I, I wanted to sort of transmit the latest neuroscientific findings about how we process pleasure and pain, what happens in the brain as we become addicted. But I wanted to do it in the context of the lived experience, my lived experience, the lived experience of my patients who had gotten into recovery, some who hadn't. So that was really the goal. Yeah. And I'm curious, did you, or what brought you into medicine and into psychiatry in particular? Well, um, psychiatry always fascinated me because um, it was really all about, you know, human beings and why they do what they do. Um, initially, I avoided psychiatry, though. I went into pathology, and that is because it was around that time when I was choosing my medical specialty that my um, a, fa a close family member of mine um, had a psychotic break and was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. So uh, that was very impactful, and I, I felt that I that if I became a psychiatrist, it would be too painful for me, um, that it would take too much out of me. So instead, I became a pathologist because I really wanted to be a teacher, and I thought I would be able to teach others about, you know, cancer and stuff like that. So, but after a couple of years of pathology, I realized, oh, this is really not for me. Um, I'm not very good at it. I don't really like it. And then I was, I felt I had some more distance then from this, uh, th this family member who was then doing much better. And I decided to uh, take the plunge and go into psychiatry. And I, I really haven't looked back. It's been a very good fit for my particular brain. And did you, how did you get into the specialty of addiction? That was very is that much, your specialty as well? Yes, I assume that is it my is, specialty, yeah. 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 And that was very much accidental. Uh, so I, I was seeing a patient for weekly psychotherapy and treating her with an SSRI, Paxil, for her depression. And she wasn't getting any better, and I really didn't know. You know I thought maybe I'd, I'd have to change her meds or focus more on you know her early childhood um, she kept nodding off in the therapy sessions. She said it was due to the Paxil. Anyway, to make a long story short, one day out of the blue, her brother called me and said she'd been in a rollover car accident. And I said, well, that's terrible. What happened? He said, well, she's been using again. And I said, using, using what? Like I didn't even 
understand the phraseology. And then he said, well, mm -hmm. she's been using heroin again. Isn't that what you've been treating her for? And of course I was mortified because I had not once asked her about drugs and alcohol. She had not volunteered that information, but of course it's not her job to do that. It's my job as a skilled practitioner uh, to uncover those highly stigmatized behaviors. And I mm. hadn't even begun to do that. So that was really the moment that I thought, wow, I'm, I'm, I think I'm a bad psychiatrist. <laughs> <laughs> I, I better learn something about addiction. And so that was, a, and that was, you know, uh, really the late 1990s when, when that sea change happened. And then I discovered I love treating patients with addiction. So lovely. Can you maybe, I never really understood the neuroscience of it as maybe as clearly as you did such an excellent job in the book of explaining. Um, can you, so as I understand, there's, I assume, do you know who Gabor Mate is? Yes. Yeah, he's sort of glorified in this space, I think, a lot. Uh, and, you know, not, he does great work. Yeah. Um, sometimes I think he tilts to one side of the story a little bit too much, but that's my biased opinion. So he, I love his definition of addiction, which I think you sort of echo in the book is sort of, we have an internal pain or trauma or discomfort. We seek outside substances to medicate that or to make the pain go away. And regardless of the negative consequences of our behavior, no matter how much we stop, we, or how much we want to stop, we can't. And then I heard recently, I think a colleague of yours or friend, I'm not sure, uh, Andrew Huberman described addiction as the narrowing of things that bring you pleasure, mm -hmm. which I thought those are two kind of nice ways of describing it because oftentimes people aren't in so much pain that, right. mm -hmm. but, and you give a couple examples of that in the book as well. Um, I guess where, do you fit on that understanding or how do you apply that to different cases and different people in different situations? Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess I'll first start by pushing back a little bit on the Gabor Mate definition yeah. that you quoted. Um, because th that his, that, you know, that conceptualization, conceptualization is, is, um, what's sometimes referred to as the self-medication hypothesis, which was okay. originally postulated by Sander Rado, um, a European psychoanalyst and an acolyte of Freud, who came up with the idea that, oh, the reason that some people can't use substances like alcohol in moderation is because they're self-medicating an underlying psychiatric disorder or emotional problem or psychological distress. And if we could just address that underlying problem, then they would stop being addicted. The problem with that is that it is true that some people begin using substances or engage in, in, in addictive behaviors to self-medicate, you know, an underlying problem. But a lot of people who get addicted don't do that at all. Uh, and they get addicted because they started using a substance to have fun, or they were curious or their doctor wrote them a prescription for it. And so they were exposed to it. And the, the point here is that there are actually lots of doorways into using addictive substances and behaviors. And frankly, one of the biggest risk factors for addiction, especially in our world today, is simple access. If you mm -hmm. live in a neighborhood where drugs are sold on a street corner, you're more likely to try them and more likely to get addicted to them. And even if you don't particularly have genetic vulnerability to addiction in today's world, almost anybody can get addicted, especially to digital media, digital content and digital devices. So I, I really like to emphasize that it's true that, you know, underlying trauma or psychiatric illness or psychological distress can be the doorway into addiction. It's, it's not the only doorway. And frankly, you can have the perfect upbringing and the perfect family, the perfect job, uh, a great house, everything you ever wanted, and you can get addicted. Uh, so I just, I just like to really emphasize that. In terms of the, you know, Andrew Huberman's comments, the sort of narrowing of the focus. Yeah, I mean, I think that really captures very nicely the ways in which um, addiction is the gradual process of overvaluing certain short-term rewards mm -hmm. 
and losing sight of other long-term rewards, especially those that don't immediately make us feel good, but that require the investment of time, energy, et cetera, over very long periods of time. So this kind of, um, kind of a, what's sometimes referred to as temporal discounting or a shortened temporal horizon, um, you know, which is very much like limbic brain or lizard brain survival mode must get this thing right now because mm. it's fundamental to my, to my survival. So addiction is in many ways the brain confusing the object of desire for something that is necessary for survival, when in fact, it's not only not necessary, but it's actually leading uh, to our demise. Hmm. And I think that maybe is a nice lead into the pleasure pain balance, which you did such a good job of explaining and it was super helpful. Can you kind of describe that for everybody? Sure. So, um, in order to understand what happens in the brain as, as we become addicted, I like to use this extended metaphor of a pleasure pain balance. Imagine that you have a teeter totter or seesaw in that reward circuit in, in, in our brains. Um, and that represents how we process pleasure and pain because one of the very interesting findings to me of the last 50 to 75 years of neuroscience is that pleasure and pain are co-located. So the yeah, same parts of the brain amazing. that, yeah, yeah it, it is really wow. interesting, right? It is, yeah. Uh, that we're processing pleasure and pain in the same way. And in many ways, if you're going to kind of really capture this idea of homeostasis, this metaphor of a balance, that when we experience pleasure, the balance tips one way. When we experience pain, it tips in the opposite direction. And there are certain rules governing this balance. The first and most important rule is that the balance wants to remain level to the ground or what neuroscientists call homeostasis. In fact, the one of the main driving forces for all living organisms is to maintain and restore homeostasis so that with any deviation from neutrality, our brains will work very hard to bring that balance back to a level position. So for example, I read a romance novel, eat a piece of chocolate, watch a good movie that releases dopamine, our reward neurotransmitter in a dedicated circuit of the brain called the reward pathway. My balance tilts to the side of pleasure. But no sooner has that happened than these neuroadaptation gremlins hop on the pain side of the balance to bring it level again. The gremlins represent this process of neuroadaptation, which is the way that our brain adapts to that increased dopamine firing, for example, down-regulating dopamine production, involuting postsynaptic dopamine receptors, um, all of which is in the pursuit of decreasing dopamine transmission back down to tonic baseline levels of firing. But the thing about those gremlins is they like it on the balance, so they don't get off as soon as we're level. They stay on until it's tilted an equal and opposite amount to the side of pain. That's the come down, the hangover, the blue Monday, or just that moment of wanting one more piece of chocolate, even while I'm still eating the first one, wanting to watch one more TikTok video, even before the first one has ended, um, being unable to uh, push the stop button when it says next episode on my Netflix series, right? That's That kind of craving is created by that sort of temporary or transient dopamine deficit state represented by the gremlins on the pain side of the balance, staying on until we're to the side of pain. Now, if we wait long enough between use, those gremlins will hop off and homeostasis will be restored. But the key, the key here to understanding what's happening in the brain is that for every pleasure, we pay a price. Sometimes we're aware of it, an obvious hangover. Sometimes it's outside of conscious awareness. But what goes up must come down before going back to that level position. Okay, so now what happens if we don't wait for those gremlins to hop off in between use, but instead we continue to use over days to weeks to months to years, which we're obviously prone to do in an environment where we have easy access. Because when those gremlins are on the pain side of the balance, we are looking for the next hit in order to restore us back to homeostasis. Because remember that drive to homeostasis is overwhelming, right? The organism and, and wants to go back there. Can I ask you, are the gremlins, maybe this isn't neuroscientific, but is it that they're doing that because they want us to stop engaging in the pleasure in some sense? Is there that d in innate desire for like s sanity, I guess, or that's where I kind of, I, I can't quite grasp sort of how that keeps us in addiction. Is it because it's so painful that we just keep seeking out 
the momentary pleasure to, to yeah. like get yeah. Them away so or a, cu- a couple things there. I think your first, the first part of your question is like, why would Mother Nature make yeah, us have right. to go to the pain side after being at the pleasure side? Why not just yeah, yeah. write the balance and have us be level and have the gremlins hop off at that point? <laughs> right. You know, it's a great question, and um, when when you think about the world in which humans have existed for most of our time on planet Earth, it has been a world of scarcity and ever-present danger where our survival was constantly uncertain. If you want to survive in a world of scarcity and ever-present danger, what better way uh, to optimize survival than, than to make sure that every pleasurable experience is fleeting and is furthermore followed by pain right. such that we are eternal seekers, never satisfied with what we have, always wanting more. So this is actually a great system in which we have to do a lot of work up front to get a little bit of pleasure. It's a terrible system in which we have to do almost no work at all to get an enormous and constant supply of pleasure. And that is, of course, the world that we live in today, which gets us to what essentially the second part of your question, which is, well, what, what is what's happening in the brain as we get addicted? Mm-hmm. Essentially, with repeated exposure to highly reinforcing drugs and behaviors, and they all, by the way, work by the same final common pathway, releasing dopamine in the reward circuitry, those gremlins start to multiply, right? Because we're, we're essentially at war with those gremlins. So now we're getting more and more and more gremlins on the pain side of the balance. Now there are enough gremlins there to fill this whole room. And eventually they're camped, they're camped out there, tents and barbecues in tow. They're in residence, okay? And once that happens, now we're entering into addicted brain where we've essentially changed our hedonic set point. Sometimes this is referred to as allostasis. So contrary to homeostasis, allostasis is a state of having to really work extra hard and change our internal baseline in order to adapt to the environment, the environment being the fire hose of dopamine releasing substances and behaviors. So now what's happened is now we're walking around with a balance that's chronically tilted to the side of pain, which means we need more of our drug and more potent forms, not to feel good, but just to level the balance and feel normal. And here's the really important piece. When we're not using, our balance is tilted to the side of pain. We're in a chronic dopamine deficit state where we've changed our hedonic set point and we're experiencing the universal symptoms of withdrawal from any addictive substance, which are anxiety, irritability, insomnia, depression, and craving. And it is that craving loop, that overwhelming craving to get back to homeostasis that drives the completely irrational and all-consuming behavior that constitutes a severe addictive disease. Right. Yeah, okay, that's, I sort of, can't help but reflect on my own <laughs> life. Uh, cannabis was my drug of choice yeah. because I knew it wouldn't kill me. You know, and you know yeah. when when you're making that decision, things are not okay. I started yeah. very young, very okay. prepubescent. Wow. And, uh, yeah, all the way up to the age of thirty. Wow. Yeah. May yeah. I ask uh, what yeah. finally prompted you to try to get into recovery? And yeah, how, I, I'm, I'm, I'm always curious because to yeah, me, it's always a yeah. miracle. It's always a it miracle. It is a miracle. So. It is a fucking yeah. miracle indeed. Mm, um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> which, which hopefully we can talk about. I'm curious kind of how you, obviously you explained it in the book, but just generally how people, yeah. how that miracle happens, so to speak. I think from about, I got you know, sort of convicted for trafficking when I was a teen, lots of con the consequences were building up. I think I don't seem to be getting emotional right now about it, but when I asked, I always do. I, I, from a little kid, whenever they asked you, what do you want to be when you grow up? I said, I want to be a dad. And yeah, it was so, and so I think I managed to, as they say, rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic in my life Mm -hmm. where I had, I had money and I was working kind of to your point earlier, it doesn't matter where you are in life. And then I got married because I thought that might fix me, so to speak, Mm -hmm. convinced myself and my wife Mm -hmm. who I'm still married Mm -hmm. to today. It was a good idea. And then that was sort of, and I was lying to her and all kinds that house of cards was kind of crumbling and the lies and the deceit. I just, that my conscience in my head 
just finally I was able mm-hmm. to listen to it because mm-hmm. from about 15 years old, it was like, this is bad. You should stop. This is bad. You should right. stop. Ah, so, so yeah, I asked a, a friend who I used to rave with and he was an addiction counselor at a treatment center. And I thought if that guy could get better, then I have a chance. Right, and, right. uh, so there, yeah. And then I just remember he gave me a big hug. He said, it doesn't have to be like this anymore. And oh. yeah, it was beautiful. And that was sort yeah. of, a, I guess that was about t- almost 12 years ago. Wow. And so still married, <laughs> lots of yeah. Al-Anon and AA and yeah. therapy and the whole yeah. nine. Um, and are, are you a dad? I am. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Of yeah, two. Of two. Yeah. Great. Great. Yeah. That's so wonderful. I did. I reached my dream and the other yeah. dream is having conversations like this. Um, yeah, nice. Which sort yeah, of all the good things that and, come yeah. with recovery. Yeah. 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 And so as you were describing the balance, I guess it just becomes more and more clear neuroscientifically to me just how many gremlins were in my brain. Yeah, in my, right. And I just, right. like you said, it was just about feeling normal and okay. It wasn't even about feeling right. happy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just getting oh. caught in it, just getting caught in it. And then yeah. it's so hard yeah. to get out. Then even when you, you do finally see it, it's, it's not easy. You know, you have to abstain for long enough for those gremlins yes. to get the memo. <laughs> okay. We're not doing this cannabis thing anymore. I guess I can get off the, the seesaw, but you know, they do it yeah. reluctantly. So, yeah. but I'm, yeah. thank you for sharing that. I, I, I think yeah. it's just so yeah. powerful and, um, and it's, yeah, it's, Indeed. it's amazing. I mean, it's an amazing life accomplishment. It is. It's sort of that idea, though. I remember my sponsor saying, only addicts want to pat on the back for things normal people do. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like the balance of like, yes, it's an accomplishment. Right. And, you know, <laughs> but, but I love it. it. You know, miracle. that's the, yeah. the humility, right? That comes with yeah. something like having to face off something like that in your life. Yeah. Uh, it's that kind of humility is, is oh, a great thing. So for sure. And maybe that's a nice segue into the another question here I want to ask you in terms of Actually, maybe two. I'll start with the, because yeah. I don't think we, or at least I, the dopamine system of addiction. You kind of described it, but I think a lot of people always assume it's that hit of dopamine, that hit of dopamine hmm. that you get from the substance or behavior. But I think as I understood from your book, at some point it actually becomes the pursuit of the substance or mm-hmm. the behavior that's mm-hmm. more I don't know if it's rewarding or what. Can you kind of describe those two things? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the pursuit of the substance and to some extent for some people, the hiding can really be part of the reinforcing aspect Mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. That kind of whole double life thing, that rebel, you know, that I have this thing that nobody else knows about that nobody else can control. It's also for many people, especially in my experience, a lot of people uh, who develop severe addictions have avoidant coping strategies. So they have a very difficult time expressing their anger, going to the person saying, I'm upset about this. So instead, they kind of go along, you know, get along to go along or go along to get along. And, um, and then they take care of themselves by themselves uh, doing, doing their drug. So, you know, that becomes sort of the self-care method. Uh, so... Yeah, so it's 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 complicated and, and all tied up, and I forgot what your question was. Yeah, no, that's okay because it was that you're describing the, uh, the oh yeah the way that the, right yes thank you versus thank the you. reward versus the yes. pursuit. Yeah. So that's a, a couple things. So you know, initially when we use reinforcing substances and behaviors, we get that hit of dopamine. Our balance tilts to the, the pleasure side, but over time, repeated effects really just lands us chronically tilted to the pain side. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden we're not using because it's pleasurable. We're using so that it's, we, you know, it stops being painful and the craving is then what is driving it even absent any pleasure. So a lot of people with severe addiction will be, will tell you, I hate this substance. I hate this behavior. I don't want to do it anymore. And yet I cannot stop. So that's part of it. The other thing that's interesting, I think is the fact that reminders of using like people, places, and things are related to our use also release dopamine followed by mm-hmm. a little mini dopamine deficit state that then triggers the cravings. So you can get into this craving loop, 
even when you're not using, but just because you saw somebody that you used to use with or went by the place where you used to use or smelled, you know, what smelled like your drug of choice or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it's not, you know, it might start out for some people as being about the pursuit of pleasure, but eventually it just becomes the pursuit of trying to not be in pain. Right. Wow. And the dopamine release in the pursuit is to just sort of make the pain go away. Is that the reward in some sense? Um, well, what, essentially, sense? once you've entered that dopamine deficit state and those gremlins yeah. have accumulated on the pain side of your balance, yeah. remember, the drive is always to homeostasis. Right. So the craving is nature's response to get you back to homeostasis. So you're, you're craving to use because it's not like really rational. It's, it's more reflexive. You just, you want to bring those dopamine levels back up to baseline or better yet above baseline, right? Cause right, now, right, cause right, you're, right. now you're below baseline. Right. Okay. And I guess maybe it kind of also fits into the next question. And you gave the example earlier of the client who you didn't ask about addiction uh, okay. earlier in your career. And I see this in clinic. Uh, I work with a psychiatrist. Uh, we sort of that's an ADHD um, specialization clinic. He's wonderful, but he often doesn't, and, and people often don't share as well, right? It's so hard to share about addiction a lot of time. But I think, and yeah. which I loved about your book, and which I has been so helpful for me in my clinical practice with people. How do you think about? psychiatry often does go to the medication and in Canada, I'm not sure what it's like in the U S at least in Ontario, I should say, cause our healthcare is provincial. I'd say 1% and maybe I'm probably off a little bit of psychiatrists actually provide psychotherapy in Ontario. So it's all a diagnosis prescription or at least recommendation for care and then take it to the therapist or take it to the whoever. And, that's certainly obviously not ideal, but I think so often clients who have addictions are also on a whole bunch of medications and it just doesn't seem like an effective way to address the problem. Again, I know things are complicated in an ideal world. How do you see that process of treating addiction, the complications of medication and perhaps our reflective healthcare system-esque approach to med to prescribing medications. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, my, as a psychiatrist, my ignorance about addiction 20 years ago was completely normative. I was not an outlier, even though I had gone to Stanford medical school and done a <laughs> psychiatry residency at Stanford. I had in fact graduated with almost no knowledge of how to screen or intervene for substance use disorders, much less, you know, other types of addictions like gambling or sex. Um, and your, your, you know, the, the Canadian experience mirrors the U S experience in the sense that, um, more and more psychiatrists who have an MD and have gone to medical school become the pres pill prescribers, right? Fewer and fewer of us are actually doing, uh, any really involved psychotherapy. So you have a kind of a perfect storm of psychiatrists, not knowing very much about addiction, not knowing how to screen and intervene uh, for the problem. Uh, not doing a whole lot of deep dive into a more holistic approach and being tasked essentially with, you know, getting out a prescription pad and, 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 and giving the folks a pill. And this is not to denigrate the psychiatric no, profession no, no. or to other psychiatrists or anything like that, but it is to admit that, you know, when you have a system that's set up that way from the get go, you know, you are going to get the problem of over prescribing. Uh, where we are prone then, even with very good intentions to write for pills that maybe our patients don't need or that might even be harmful for them, especially if they're potentially addictive, like in the realm of opioids, benzodiazepines, and stimulants. Because if I, as a psychiatrist, am ignorant about the addictive potential of those drugs, um, I'm not going to know how to even monitor for whether or not my patient is getting addicted. And what I saw in my career after I had my sort of, you know, awakening uh, vis-a-vis 
the need for me to treat addiction is everybody sent those patients my way or they, they accidentally ended up in my practice. And of course, I could then see that, you know, Dr. Smith was prescribing the stimulants that this person was uh, binging and hoarding or crushing and snorting or whatever it was. You know, I, I saw that Dr. Jones had prescribed the Xanax that this person now was desperately trying to get off and couldn't get off. Um, so uh, we, we need a wholesale shift in education um, and also uh, incentives to change mm -hmm. the way that we address uh, mental health care problems because prescribing a pill, although very useful and even life-saving for some patients some of the time, um, basically hasn't been shown to be effective for most patients much of the time. Right. Um, and when we're dealing with addiction, those pills basically don't work very well. So when people are in there actively in their addiction, you know, their Depakote and their Prozac and their stimulants and their, you know, whatever it is, olanzapine, it doesn't work well when people are smoking a lot of pot, you know, drinking a lot of alcohol, snorting cocaine, or probably even when they're shopping and playing video games and masturbating and, you know, gambling and eating and whatever else it is. So that's why we really recommend integrated treatment where we get people from the very beginning who are struggling with addictive behaviors, we try to get them into recovery. And I always say to them, it's not that we're going to be ignoring your other mental health care problems. Your ADHD is very important. Your chronic pain is very important. Your depression, your anxiety. But the truth of the matter is we are not going to make much headway in uh, treating those disorders as long as you're still smoking pot, drinking alcohol, uh, snorting cocaine, you know, taking whatever massive amounts of Oxycontin. So we have to do the things together, integrated care. We have to do the treatment in parallel. And what we discover is for some patients, when they get into, you know, robust, sustained recovery, it turns out they don't need all those pills, right? And because, of course, addiction is the great mimic. People can look manic and psychotic when they're intoxicated. They can look depressed and anxious when they're in withdrawal and, and everything in between. Uh, but when people get into sustained recovery, many of them actually, it turns out, don't have bipolar disorder, right? And can get off of their mood stabilizers, which means that they don't have to deal with all the side effects and all of that. So it's super important that we are address these things simultaneously, that we do a better job educating Mental health care providers about, you know, the relationship between addiction and other uh, psychiatric comorbidities. It's basically a fear, feed forward cycle. People with psychiatric illness are more likely to get addicted mm -hmm. and people who are addicted are more likely to have psychiatric <laughs> illness. It goes both ways. Indeed, it does. Um, oh, what was I going to ask you on that note? Oh, this is from your book, which I also found helpful, the neuroscience for the people that are sort of research scientifically inclined the I, the point that you make about restoring the balance and the need for at least a period of abstinence i remember when i sort of entered recovery i think however helpful it is the the sort of aa notion is a year before you go seek psychiatric evaluation oh interesting okay yeah at least i didn't know it was a whole I, year i didn't know it was a whole year yeah. uh-huh that's interesting and it is. Yeah. And that's pretty smart. That's pretty smart. If you can make it a year, that's probably good <laughs> right, advice. Right, yeah. yeah. And so how, how, so you, in the book, you sort of recommend the neuroscience says ideally at least a month or something, 28 mm -hmm. days, right. I think. A month of abstinence from your drug of right. choice in order right. to reset reward pathways. Yeah. Right. And so then I think that that's helpful for people because at least that thought I remember, you know, how am I supposed to, I can't go literally an hour without getting high. How am I supposed to go yeah. a year, the rest of my right. life kind of idea. So giving people that short term goal perhaps is super helpful in your clinical experience. And you do talk about this in the book. So you, you suggest that people agree, so to speak, they get to the end and I love your dopamine acronym as well. Mm -hmm. uh, if we had more time, I would ask you oh, so many more questions about all that. Um, you, it's sort of the experiment or the next steps idea. So yeah, maybe just in your experience, how do you, and maybe it's in your assessments, what I uh, seem to, I don't know if I per se struggle with, but as, as we all kind of 
learn how to help people through these things. Mm -hmm. There's some people that abstinence certainly is the key. There's other people that perhaps maybe it's not. Right. How do you kind of navigate all of that? Well, you know, I just see the whole thing as one big life experiment. And I talk about it in that way. And as you know, the, the E on the, of the last dopamine acronym, the last letter is E, and E stands for experiment. And I say to patients, even if your long-term goal is to go back to using your drug of choice, um, you should start with a month of abstinence from that drug to reset reward pathways. Um, because in clinical experience, patients are much more likely to be successful with moderation Mm -hmm. uh, if they first abstain for four weeks, people say, well, why can't I just reduce? Cause my goal is to just reduce. I said, well, you, you, you could try, but in my experience, it doesn't work. Number one, right. it doesn't work. And number two, the reason it probably doesn't work is because it turns out it's just harder to go down a little bit and keep using than it is to go cold Turkey. And because when you do that, you're not giving the gremlins a chance to hop off and to reset reward pathways. So once people, you know, buy into the idea of a dopamine fast, you know, as you ask, well, what, 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 what do you do when it's over? Like, okay, dopamine fasting. And by the way, I always like to qualify. I'm not talking about the Silicon Valley dopamine fast where you go hide in a cave for a week. I'm talking about <laughs> choosing that particular substance or behavior that is compulsive and that is interfering with your goals and values, hopes and dreams. Eliminate that for a month. And only do that, obviously, if you're not going to be at risk for life-threatening withdrawal, because, of course, right. alcohol withdrawal, benzo withdrawal, in some cases, opioid withdrawal can be life-threatening. So if you're in that category, please go see a medical specialist. Don't, don't, don't take this kind of uh, sort of home remedy. But most people can stop without life-threatening withdrawal if they're able to stop on their own. If not, again, go seek a higher level of medical care. And then when they um, come back a month later after having abstained, you, I, we just make a very specific plan. Do you want to moderate or do you want to continue to abstain? We do that, by the way, after we've done a pros and cons list. So like, well, what was good about not using? What was bad about not using, right? The good list is usually very, very long, less anxious, less depressed, less ruminative, slept better, more present, got more done. The bad list, though, usually is topped by two things. was really bored, didn't know what to do with all the time on my hands. And couldn't hang out with my friends because all my friends use. And those are, those are real bad things. So talking about those. And then the question is, okay, well, long list of good things. Do you want to go back to using in moderation or do you want to go back to using or do you want to, you know, continue to abstain? Honestly, the first time around, most people want to go back to using. So I may be thinking in my mind, this person should absolutely never go back to using. But, you know, <laughs> it's not really that helpful for me to say that. Because they've done the experiment, they, they feel better, you know, they've proven to themselves they can control their use. Now they want to try going, you know, you got to meet them where they are. But we make a very specific list of what that will look like, how much, how often, what potency, in what circumstances, what are your red flags, how are you going to be accountable to yourself and others. And then they come back and we say, well, were you able to stick to it? And if they're repeatedly not able to, then eventually you get to the point where you're like, it looks like moderation is not working for you. Or sometimes the discussion is even, well, you know, moderation is working. You're like, you're able to do it, but you don't seem very happy doing it. Like it's so much effort. Maybe it's not worth it. And some patients will say that it's not worth the effort, I'd rather just abstain. So then, you know, you just, you just work in that way. Thank you. Um, and maybe this kind of leads into the recovery process often you have the notion of radical honesty and, and I'm very fond of the 12 step process. I'm also fond of other approaches. Mm -hmm. uh, radical honesty is you know, step one. The principle is honesty. Right. And I'm curious how you navigate, which you also did such a lovely job describing in the book. And I think this is hard for me as a clinician the the sort of self disclosure stuff around how we share our experiences in a way that's helpful and informative mm -hmm. as opposed mm -hmm. to self serving and i think mm -hmm. the field maybe if it doesn't take too long a little history on why to me it just seems counterproductive for the therapist to be a brick wall mm -hmm. and right. you often hear you hear that often maybe not a brick wall, but where they're very sort of 
nothing is said about them. Right. And there's a mm-hmm. whole philosophy behind that. So I'm curious how you see the radical honesty in terms of, I think you even mentioned in the book, it's a preventative measure to addiction, mm-hmm. I think. Mm-hmm. And I think yeah. Yeah. you gave the family example. <laughs> yeah, this the chocolate bunny story, which is right. great. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, maybe I'm too honest with my kids cause I'm, I'm very sensitive to the honesty yeah. piece. So there's the personal honesty and how that fits into recovery. And then maybe m- more as a clinician or just a human being, how do you see the concept of self-disclosure and psychotherapy and in helping people? Yeah. Well, thank you for that. You know, I have been greatly influenced by Alcoholics Anonymous and other 12 step groups uh, in my psychiatric career and have come to see the incredible value of people sharing uh, in a judicious way when they've struggled with something similar uh, to a person who is really in the midst of, of, of a crisis. And, um, you know, the, and, and as such, over the course of my career, I have moved further and further away from this idea that we are a blank wall and that we are just like a Teflon that their stuff bounces off of mm-hmm. and really more braced in this idea that we, we couldn't really, um, we couldn't really hide ourselves if we tried. Like there are so <laughs> many ways that we are present. And I've also become really convinced that the realness of our presence is actually very helpful to patients because when you're working in the transference, what can be so healing for them is to like have an honest interactions where my feelings to some extent in a measured mm-hmm, and mm-hmm, thoughtful mm-hmm. way, you mm-hmm. know, become part of the work that we do together so that there's a crucible in which they can work through those things and then potentially see that, you know, you don't just have to like run away. You can actually work this stuff out. You can talk it through and they can take that and go and, and apply that to the relationships in their real lives. So in ways large and small, um, I have a, a much more interactive style. First of all, I often use the we pronoun. So although I'm not a member of Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics mm-hmm. Anonymous, I could easily be a, a member of Codependency Anonymous. Um, but I'm not, I'm not officially a member. But we're all human beings. We all have reward circuitry. We're all potentially vulnerable to the problem of addiction. So when I talk about addiction and I'm teaching patients, I'll use the we pronoun, right? And I'll use that, you know, in a way that I think just like talking about kind of shared humanity. So that's a mm-hmm. small mm-hmm. kind of disclosure yeah. thing. And then I will periodically, depending upon the patient or the client, um, you know, actually say, oh, yeah, you know, I, I, I can really relate to that or I... I've struggled with things like that too. Now you don't want to do that too much because of course, what is key to the therapeutic encounter is that we come to our patients with our emotional, physical, sexual needs met, right? We've Mm -hmm. taken care of that elsewhere. So we are coming to them full up, right? We're not coming in need because they're coming to us in need. So we need to be able to be fully present for their needs. That's why we're there, right? We're focused on you and your needs, not, not my needs. And so as long as you know, we, we as therapists or psychiatrists or whatever it is are getting our needs met and, and practicing wellness and taking good care of ourselves so that we can come to our patients full up, then I think in that context, you know, being thoughtful about what we're doing, it's, it's okay to share that we also struggle. I think it can be incredibly helpful and humanizing for patients who are sometimes prone to put us kind of on a pedestal and imagine Mm -hmm. that our lives are perfect. (laughs) Yeah, which they certainly are not. Right. Um, Which again, you do a lovely job in the book of sharing those things about yourself. I'm curious as we sort of get to the end here, this idea of pro-social shame, which I love, one of my teachers actually in in Ontario MDs can provide psychotherapy which is wonderful it's also yeah. very rare mm-hmm. if they have a specialty i have a a teacher she's an md she provides mindfulness based groups through ohip like through our which is just what a miracle that is mm. so i've been taking sort of M, my mindfulness based stress reduction i've taken with her she provides a couple other ones and in that context, there's some pro-social shame, right? In group healing and that kind of thing. Outside of AA, and, and I struggle with this 
with clients too, because so much of the healing from addiction is pro-social shame. Mm -hmm. yeah. And actually that lost my thought. That's where I learned about pro-social shame from, from Heidi, who talked mm -hmm. her walk. Mm -hmm. And it, I was like, wow, what a thoughtful, I don't, you know, we don't often think about that. Right. And can you, yeah, I guess just how you see that fitting into this whole picture and outside of 12 step groups, I know there's, have you heard of smart recovery? Yep. Of course. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know too much about it, but it doesn't seem as much of a pro social shame model, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. I guess I'm just kind of curious how you see the idea of pro social shame and maybe more particularly in terms of recovery models for people yeah. or how, because the one on one stuff, I always say to people, I mean, depending on how far down they are, you know, one on one is great, et cetera. My bias is that it's not enough if mm -hmm. you really want to recover. Yeah. So, sometimes you know outside of aa or whatever it's like i don't know really what to say because there's not much out there mm, um, mm -hmm. so i guess i don't know if that was a statement i think it was a statement and a question but <laughs> can you kind yeah. of share your thoughts on well that? i mean yeah so so for well yeah so stepping back just a little bit i mean when you think about shame very often in today's culture we reflexively think it's a bad thing Right. You know, cancel culture, body shaming. I mean, there's a mm -hmm. lot of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, stigmatization and shaming that goes on, which is bad. Um, and it's also really true that people in addiction can become so shameful and self-loathing about their mm -hmm. addiction mm -hmm. that that then hampers their ability to go get help. Right. And then they try to yeah. use as a way to not feel the shame. But I think it's really important to acknowledge that shame is a necessary emotion. And if we didn't feel shame, um, you know, about, about things that we were doing or that we might do, there would be no incentive or deterrent to doing those things. Sometimes people talk about guilt is different from shame. Um, you know, shame is something that where you hate yourself. Guilt is where you feel bad about the behavior, but you don't hate yourself. I mean, that's one conceptualization. But I can, in my experience, when I feel guilt and shame, they're, I'm not feeling anything different. They're the, sort of the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I, what I tried to do is I make the distinction between pro-social shame, which I think is shame that actually motivates us to change our behavior in a positive direction, and destructive or malignant shame, which is the kind of shame where we're just sort of circling the drain. Um, and so then the question is, okay, well, how, how do we augment pro-social shame? And I think the key there is actually acknowledging when someone has done something shameful and whether, whether we're doing that as parents or as therapists or with a friend, you know, not trying to say, oh, well, that's okay, or it doesn't matter, or well, it wasn't your fault or, but it just take them on like, yeah, that, that's hard to carry that wrong thing. You know, that, that thing that, and, and I loved how you started out our conversation and especially talking about your own recovery as really your, your conscience getting mm -hmm. louder or you're paying attention to, to conscience. I mean, conscience is an interesting word because it has a lot of sort of, you know, religious or moral overtones, but it's really a perfectly good word for, you know, those voices that come up in the very pro-social regions of our brain, wherever they may be, that say to us, you know, in ways large and small, you know, that was, you shouldn't have done that, right? Or, right, right. you know what, you should probably apologize or, gosh, you know, you haven't contacted that person in a long time, probably time to pick up the phone. All those little things that today we drown out by constantly distracting ourselves with uh, all the stuff that we're doing. And also, I think in a way, by telling ourselves that we shouldn't feel shame because mm -hmm. shame will contribute to, you know, lowered self-esteem and I need to feel pot. But, you know, then you end up, though, like with, you know, obvious narcissistic sociopathic people who don't feel any appropriate shame for anything they, they do. And so... You know, you don't want to go too far in that direction. So it's kind of right. finding that middle road. And then I, I do talk about Alcoholics Anonymous as an organization that I think is both marvelously de-shaming in that mm -hmm. people go there and realize, oh, wow, I'm not the only one. And this this person telling their story, like, that sounds exactly like my life. And I thought, you know, I was so 
so malignant or so <laughs> right. special in a way, so sp off, yeah, especially yeah. awful. Yeah. But it turns mm -hmm. out, oh gosh, this is the same thing happened to me. So wonderfully deshaming. But on the other hand, um, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous really leverages this pro-social shame by saying, okay, those are the things you struggle with, but now here's something you can do differently, starting with being radically honest, working the steps, getting a sponsor, being of service, you know, and it doesn't, um, it doesn't turn people away when they've relapsed, right? In mm -hmm. fact, a relapse is, is strengthens the community because that you come back as a newcomer uh, and you tell your story again. But they will shame people, for example, not telling the truth or potentially not adequately working the program, right? Yeah, and so yeah. it's a way to use leverage that very nuanced emotion of shame to bring people into the fold and push them, you know, into uh, recovery, which is working for millions of people around the globe. Yeah. So yeah. it's not for everybody, that's for sure. sure. And yeah, some, some people sure. exper yeah. experience it as, as negative, and that's always sad. Yeah. But yeah. it, uh, in terms of that, you know, that sort of piece of it, I think Alcoholics Anonymous has really figured it out. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. And my, maybe my last question is uh, personal, but you share it in the book. I'm very curious, uh, and I do this with a lot of clients who are not addicts or alcoholics mm -hmm. or whatever, mm -hmm. struggling. You did, you talk about how you went through the steps with your supervisor mm -hmm. and in particular, the fourth step, uh, you talk about your mom and can you just share with people a little bit about how sometimes you hear the opposite of resentment is gratitude, which I'm not sure, I, I guess, cause I'm a 12 stepper and, and whatever, but I think the opposite of resentment is responsibility. And so mm -hmm. you, you do such a great job in the book again, of describing your experience with the fourth step and your mom. Can you maybe just talk a little bit about what that was like and how that helps you on a daily basis? Yeah. Thanks for asking. Not many people ask me about that actually. So, you know, I had done a ton of psychotherapy in my life trying to uh, resolve my conflict with my mother, which had really had been ever since I can remember from the earliest time. She and I were just like, you know, oil and vinegar. We just <laughs> couldn't make it work. Both really kind of wanted it to work, but we just couldn't get along. Maybe too similar. I don't know. Um, and what what I discovered in retrospect was that much of that psychotherapy, although helpful in some ways, also really um, got me to nurse my resentments, right? Mm -hmm. To cling to my resentments, to have this narrative in which I had been victimized by her in a variety of ways. And in, in essence, kind of just worsened the rift. Um, you know, I, and I'm not blaming at all on that, that psychotherapy. There were, there were other reasons there as well. But it was really only in working the, the 12 steps with my supervisor at the time and really being, you know, radically honest about my character defects and what I had contributed to the problem that I had this aha, aha moment that I hadn't had in all those years of individual mm -hmm. psychotherapy. And it was really the, the realization that, wow, I really, I am at least 50% responsible for my, uh, not very good relationship with her. And it was just a huge, huge turning point. Uh, the, you know, just the realization, the ways in which we create these narratives and then our behaviors, uh, perpetuate our perceptions, right? We, 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 we shape our reality to fit our um, vision or view of the world. And that was the first time that I was able to kind of let go of that really maladaptive view of the world um, own, you know, my own contribution. And then amazingly, the knot starts to unravel. and I'm mm -hmm. able to both forgive her and forgive myself and develop, you know, what is not a close relationship, um, but is a much more respectful, kind relationship. You know, before it was like every encounter, we would both leave with more barbs in our skin. And we don't do that anymore. Um, and it really wasn't until I was able to see what I contributed that, that uh, hmm. I was able to break that pattern. I don't know if she even really knows what happened. I mean, she's read, she's read the book, obviously she said, yeah. <laughs> but I described it accurately that I got it right. But that was, it was just nice. That um, is nice. you yeah. know, that she was able to read it and, and say that a lot of kudos to her because, you know, 
must have been hard on some level. Indeed, indeed. Okay, well, Dr. Lemke, Anna, thank you so much. I, You're I, very welcome. Selfishly, would like to talk to you for longer. <laughs> I know, me <laughs> but, too. It's know, been yeah, really yeah. good to talk to you. It's been it's lovely. Been so, yeah, nice the book is Dopamine Nation: Finding Balance in an, in the Age of Indulgence. And yeah, just a sincere, you know, heartfelt thank you so much for your work, and also oh, just you. for uh, agreeing to do this and spending the time talking to me. So, thank you well, so my, much. My pleasure. Thank you so okay. much too for your work and for having me on your show. Okay. Okay. Take it easy. See you later. Bye. Bye.